there's a word which has come into focus in the, well, phrase really, that's come into focus in the last year or so, which is toxic masculinity, mm. which is basically, I think, this notion that uh, encourage, the, within media and advertising, encouraging uh, men to sort of be this caricature of an alpha male that's very kind of perhaps insensitive or not so aware, in touch with their feelings and, you know, well-built uh, and just very... Uh, I don't really know how to explain it. You, you get the image I'm kind of... Uh, Dominant, saying. controlling, powerful. Yes, exactly. Um, the question is, do you think there's such a... Do you think this is, is the case? Um, how would you define toxic masculinity? Um, do you think there sh- sh- the answer should be less masculinity or good masculinity? And if so, what is that? <laughs> I always fire about 10 questions in one. Uh, but, yeah, uh... that's, that's the, you know, um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. I think, look, I think that, that assuming we can get to grips with what masculinity is and what femininity is, uh, one would assume the world needs both of them. Zachana Keva Barasam, God created the male and female. Um, and that's what humanity has to have. Like everything in, in Torah, we always assume that, that something can shift off to an extreme. Um, and then there's the programming of the human brain. What has masculinity needed to be? You know, what has the brain evolved to look for? What are, what, what, what are the male and female brains evolved to look for in each other? What are they evolved to look for in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in males and females and so forth in general? And, and then what society shaped and why has it done it? Um, I think, to, to my understanding is, is, you know, we could talk about toxic masculinity in the sense of dominance and, and abuse of power. Power in general, I think Torah is in rebellion against. And it's very often associated with and drive for it linked to masculinity, a certain type. Um, but there is a corollary that's very important, that's taking responsibility. You see, often when people fight power, they think the alternative is no responsibility. So in human societies over history, they kind of developed into city-states and empires and built around militarism and, and power. And that was a way to exert control and so forth. And alternatives stayed away from that, were either deliberately sedentary or, or lived outside of, of cities or, or, or um, built monasteries and equivalent and so forth. That's more, let's say, in, in, in parts of Asia and so forth. But th- those were kind of polarities, not necessarily always in contact with each other. Um, but... I think what, what uh, and when Torah actually has quite a skeptical view, for example, of cities, you know, Cain kills, he goes and builds a city, right? The, the next cities we encounter, uh, Abram and Sarah go down into Egypt, what is apparently is a city and, and it's dangerous that they're, they're taking women and you have male abuse of, of women there. You have... Um, it's not Jerusalem though. Well, that's what I'm going to come to. It, it's, it's very interesting that throughout Torah, the only time we talk about cities as positive places, cities are refuge. In Jerusalem fact, is the city of refuge. City Jerusalem is not is not spoken. Oh, we don't speak about the city of Jerusalem in the Torah mm. per se. We, we, the place, the Mount Moriah, is spoken of in Torah. Um, the, the, the temple the, by the time the Torah is finished is a portable place. Eventually, we, we're allowed to settle we, and, and make Jerusalem the capital, and then mm. it has a whole bunch of conditions around it. Mm. Right. So the, the, there is the possibility of creating the city. There is the possibility, but it has to always be with the with the limitations of power. Torah puts limits on the power of, of kings, right? Limits on the power of wealthy people, right? Kings can't have too much wealth, can't have too much power, there's a supreme court. Wealthy people have to redistribute land every 50 years. Priests who have a different type of power aren't allowed to own uh, economic resources and so forth. And there's a reason for that, which is, uh, you know, yes, it's, I guess we call it the actum's dictum of power corrupts and, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely, but. It's, I think Torah in general is in, in rebellion against power, but instead it wants responsibility. It doesn't want abdication of, of the world to, to, uh, to be the alternative. So that, I guess, would be what we'd call a, a healthy masculinity. Mm. Um, but men and women can both have that. But that, that's the model that the Torah is looking for. It likes the fact that Moses doesn't want to be a prophet. Mm. You know. Um, it, it likes the fact that, uh, that, that it will make the fact that King David can't build a temple. Well, then, why does God get so angry with Moses when he keeps refusing leadership? Uh, eventually, angry. Because eventually it starts to be about not taking responsibility. And that's the balance. You don't want power, great. You don't want to dominate a position over your brother, great, right? But, you, but eventually, you know, I've sent you on a mission, there's, there's a job to do, right? 
I've told you how it can work. Now you've got to take responsibility. Um, King David can't build a temple, even though wars he fought may have been necessary and justified, but the fact is he's exerted power over others to the point of killing. His son, King Solomon, who's going to be called Peace, can, and so forth. These are very subtle lines. Even the concept that's very much in sort of a chosen nation. The Torah's words are Mamlechet Kohanim, a nation, a kingdom of priests. Now, priests in the ancient world usually meant people with power. Um, in Torah, they're people who don't have that sort of power. Mm. Um, can't own land, I think. That's what, yeah, exactly. They can't own land, amongst other things. But they have responsibility. They're held, as the tribe of Levi, responsible for the rest, how the nation's operating. So you're, a, you're going to be a nation of people taking responsibility. That's the, 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 the line, I think, over there. And, you know, in, in contemporary context, there's a question of, for example, you know, you imagine the big CEO is so wealthy that they can manipulate um, somebody in their firm, either be cruel in a way because they own, own them, almost like, although there's, you know, not an official servitude relationship, but that feeling, and that's come up recently on the news, and of course, in, in male-female relationship and, 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 and abuse in that sort of sense and, and getting people to do what you want because of that power. So those are, yes, those would be very dangerous applications. Power in general is dangerous. Now, if you think about it, one of the challenges we have in modern firms and modern economies is things are structured around honor and power. Even wealth past a certain point starts to potentially be about honor and power. Now, again, like I said before, all those things can be used to have a, a corollary that's good. Honor is about doing honorable, doing good in the world. Doing good in the world instead of honor, I mean. Um, making a difference and taking responsibility instead of seeking power. Those would be beautiful things. And then if a person wants to, to, to harness financial resources, give to the world, the world gives back finances, they can then use to take responsibility and do good. That's good. But when it's about controlling people, having power over people, um, that's bad. So you think there is a, a good form of masculinity, basically? Well, we better hope there is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, what, what, why but, shouldn't taking responsibility will equally be a, a feminine? Of course feminine, it will. You know? Of course it should. When we talk masculinity, so what's the difference? When we talk masculinity and femininity in the first place, you can debate. I mean, everybody has bits of all of them. You can. I mean, there's endless debates unresolved about to what extent any of these are genetic and to what extent they're, they're societal. To you know, and why and how and and to what extent there's even societal dynamics reflect evolutionary realities versus. You know, we can get murky into all of this. I think when we use words like masculinity and femininity, when we look at at least the way men tend to be and women tend to be, we do see more of the natural drive towards things that orient to, if you like, in its negative power, in its perhaps positive big picture responsibility, and, and uh, women tending towards a much stronger sense of empathy, relationship, care, that type of thing. And of course you need both. Of course, you can't solve big problems if society doesn't have its tight glue, right? The un non-empathetic great visionary leader can destroy the world. And we had plenty of them in history too. People with beautiful visions who smashed up millions of human beings mm. in the name of beautiful visions. Mm -hmm. People who've flown airplanes into buildings in the name of peace, right? People who killed 20 million people in the name of promoting the, the oppressed, right? So, so no, you can't have any form of trying to take responsibility for things that doesn't begin from the nurturing caring. And the nurturing caring naturally evolves towards responsibility. So they're really just two, mod two modalities and polarities. It happens to be more exhibited in men and more in women generally. Again, is that something that will change as society changes? Is that something that's natural and hardwired? If it is, it can also be accident, mm. you know? And, and, and uh, does the world need more femininity? I think the answer is that yes. Um, does it need certain types of femininity, masculinity? No, you know. And that's something society's wrestling with and grappling with. It, it, mm. It's a conversation happening. To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.